Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Laman Sana, the D. Willis James Professor of Missions and World Christianity at the Yale Divinity School, a professor of history, and the director of the Project on Religious Freedom and Society in Africa at the Macmillan Center. He is the author of more than 200 articles on religious and historical subjects and of several books, including Disciples of Nations, Pillars of World Christianity. Today we'll talk with Professor Sana about his new book, Beyond Jihad. Welcome, Professor Sana. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Well, the book Beyond Jihad is about the story of a pacifist movement in West African Islam that started eight, nine hundred years ago. Okay. And my interest in the subject is to try and discover what held the group together over such a long period of time they rejected jihad, and how did they survive the threat of jihad when they came upon it? Mm -hmm. And in the process, I was also interested in accounting for the history of the Mali Empire, which is one of the most spectacular kingdoms in West Africa, mm -hmm. um, founded about 1200 AD uh, and survived until the end of the 16th century. And the role of these religious scholars who are pacifists within the empire was also something I was very, very interested in. Okay. And uh, let's define the term jihad. What do you mean by that? Of course, jihad is used in two special ways okay. um, in Islam. Uh, one way of defining jihad, jihad in Arabic means struggle or effort. Okay. Uh, the way it's used in the Quran, um, in chapter 9 of the Quran, it has a military or militant connotation. Mm -hmm. Religious scholars, however, uh, define jihad as an internal struggle, as a kind of spiritual discipline, mm -hmm. um, an effort to center one's will in God and to be in a very sort of strong moral position vis-a-vis -vis the attractions of the world. And spiritual jihad uh, is actually called by the scholars the greater jihad mm -hmm. and the military or militant jihad is called the lesser jihad. But I use it historically. I'm not really uh, involved in a kind of theological examination mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the idea. I'm interested in the historical uses of jihad in West African Islam. Okay. Let's talk about the methodology. How did you do the research for the book? Well. I have to say that no one had written a book on the subject before. Mm -hmm. And when I was in graduate school, uh, my thesis director of dissertation supervisor uh, in American language um, asked me if I knew anything about this pacifist group mm -hmm. in African Islam. I said no. But I said no, I meant two things. First, I don't know them, and I'm not really sure I want to know them uh -huh. because such a group sounds to me incredulous. I couldn't believe that there was a pacifist movement anywhere in Islam, let alone in African Islam. And why is that? Well, because I was familiar with the role of war and warfare in the origins of Islam. Mm -hmm. um, a famous book um, uh, Montgomery Watt wrote is called Muhammad, uh, Prophet and Statesman. And so my, the idea for me growing up and learning about Islam was that Islam was both a uh, religion and a state and a political system. Uh, and the idea of pacifist Islam sort of begins to suggest that there was some sort of separation between religion and politics, between church and state. And really I had no intellectual foundation to grasp that idea at all. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was reluctant and also incredulous at the okay. idea. So how did you um, go about doing the research for the book? I discovered to my embarrassment that actually I did know something about this tradition. Um, I only denied it and suppressed it. So in the first place, I looked at what scholars may have written about the subject, mm -hmm. uh, mostly French. And I found a few articles scattered here and there, uh, and some Western scholars who've written about this particular group called the Jahanka clerics as a kind of commercial enclave. And that again struck me as a little bit odd mm -hmm. because they were really specialists in religion and commerce was not their specialty. 
Anyway, I read up on that and then I went to the archives. Uh, went to Paris and looked at the colonial archives. Um, and after all of that, I came back, uh, organized my notes, and then went into the field to do research among the people themselves. And really, there is no shortcut, there is no alternative to doing field work, to get to know these people mm -hmm. and these communities, because that was the only way I really could overcome my uh, sort of uh, reservations about the subject. Where were you um, doing the field work? Well, I started in Senegal, okay. um, and because the groups were based really in Senegal, and then I was going to Guinea, but the main branch of the community had moved from Guinea to Senegal, so I interviewed them in Senegal. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was in Ghana, I looked at some of the uh, archives, the Arabic manuscripts, uh, and then I discovered an Arabic manuscript that had been actually translated and published uh, in a journal in Kano, mm -hmm. uh, in Nigeria. Uh, so that was extremely helpful to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so. And uh, in what way was it helpful? Well, because it showed it's a kind of um, uh, Arabic chronicle that describes a branch of these same people mm -hmm. that I was studying who had migrated from um, <clears throat> what today would be Mali across to Kano in Nigeria in the 15th century. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the hint that actually this is a very old ancient community. And I look at the two famous uh, chronicles uh, that most historians know about, a uh, history of Songhai, uh, two famous chronicles, and they also describe uh, these communities going back to the 15th century. And then I found a Portuguese source, uh, Diago Gomes, uh, who wrote about this community in the 1450s. Mm -hmm. uh, long before Columbus. Wow. So I was really, I felt, okay, there's solid historical support uh, for really describing this community uh, as a clerical community dedicated to religion, opposed to war and warfare, mm -hmm. and unwilling to be political rulers themselves. Rather, rather odd. Right, right. Um, because, you know, today the words jihad and Islam mm -hmm. carry such a connotation of violence. Yes. Um, and historically, as you're saying, mm -hmm. that's not the case. Yes. Um, how do you think it evolved to get to that point? Well, I, I don't know. I'm only speculating here because mm -hmm. I'm really a pedestrian historian. Right. Uh, political scientists would have an angle on this, which right. would be very illuminating. Uh, but I think uh, in the 19th century, when the Muslim world, after the caliphate, 1928, really, the end of the mm -hmm. caliphate, uh, by which time the Muslim world had encountered colonial rule, and colonial rule um, organized the Muslim world into nation states. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the Ottoman Caliphate in the 1920s, uh, nation states were created in the Arab world. Saudi Arabia, for example, came into being in various Syria, uh, Iraq. Uh, and so these national state jurisdictions elevated the whole idea of Islam to a political level. And so it's very easy, I think, in the 20th century and 21st century for people to think, oh, Islam is politics and politics is Islam. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's really quite accurate. If you look at Sharia, for example, which has a very bad name mm -hmm. in the West, Sharia rule is intolerant and bigoted and violent and cutting of limbs and suppressing women. Sharia, paradoxically, was created, founded by scholars, all of whom were persecuted by the political rulers, all of them. Mm -hmm. And they were all independent of politics, and the great law schools in Islam were all independent of political dynasties. Mm -hmm. um, so this little group in West Africa opened my eyes to the wider picture of how Islam conceives of itself as a religious mandate rather than as a political construct. I see. Um, so basically, what do you conclude in your book? What I conclude in my book is that there is um, not exactly a tradition of separation of church and state in Islam, because that's going too far. Um, there are no organized institutions where religion belongs uh, under the leadership of religious masters, and politics belongs to another realm mm -hmm. under uh, the leadership of political masters. But that there is a distinction 
in Islamic thought between politics and religion. That political power uh, is separated in Islamic thought from religious authority. I mean, religious authority really depends on moral authority and moral influence. Mm -hmm. There is no pope, no Vatican in Islam. Islam is the least bureaucratic of religions. Uh, mosques don't have membership lists until maybe recently. Mm -hmm. um, and there is no ordained clergy as such, uh, at least in Sunni Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Islam strikes me as very democratic in mm -hmm. its view of the membership of the community. Everyone is equal in the eyes of God. The law of God is the same for everyone, whether you're a king or commoner or ruler or poor or rich or strong or weak. So it seems to me that this is very compatible with the American idea of religion as an institution of civil society, uh, so that Islam belongs in civil society more than it does in the state. Mm -hmm. And I think in conversations in America, uh, we can appropriate some of these ideas. After all, the creators, the founders of the American Republic, Jefferson, John Adams, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, um, Thomas Jefferson, they, they all actually were aware of Islam. Mm -hmm. And given America's constitution of no prescri prescription for religion, they said we would welcome a mufti from Constantinople, um, really Istanbul, uh, in our pulpit. Benjamin Franklin said they would be welcome in our meeting house in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, Jefferson himself uh, welcomed Muslims in the White House. Um, so it seems to me that if we get over the present political hang up uh, and all this sort of uh, extreme uh, rhetoric, uh, I think we can appreciate how really the spirit of Islam as a civil institution um, is not incompatible with American ideas of freedom of religion. Yes, that would be nice if that could happen. Yeah. If there was one thing that you'd like people to take away from reading your book, what would it be? Well, the first thing I think I would like people to take away, um, we are very political in America, mm -hmm. and almost every idea we have, we want to sort of uh, express it in political terms. But I think there is a case to be made for understanding religion as a matter of, if you like, individual rights, but really a matter of the conscience. Um, the great heritage of America, the Puritan heritage, really developed very strong social institutions uh, which describe religion as a matter of individual freedom or conscience. In Islam, I think this idea is not so alien. Mm -hmm. You cannot worship God if you are compelled to worship God, because that's really not worship anymore, there's mm -hmm. something else. And you can't love your neighbor if you are under duress. Now, it seems to me that civil society needs values that the state cannot produce. The state can use those values, but it cannot produce them. Mm -hmm. And so we have a responsibility in religious communities uh, to train children in the ethics and the virtues of truthfulness, honesty, hard work, concern and mm -hmm. sensitivity to the neighbor and so forth and so on. And those are really civil values. They're not necessarily state values. Right, right. This has been very interesting. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoy being here. For more information about Professor Sana and his research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.